Manny, let's uh, begin at the beginning. You were born in Riga, Latvia, 1936, but your family's stay there was really a short one. Can you tell us a little bit about your parents, where they were from, what brought them there, and how they met? My father was born in what was then Austro-Hungary, and it was part of Hungary, but it was actually Transylvania. You might know it a lot better because there was a very famous count that came from that part of the world. You remember him? My father claimed not to have met him. But the point is, that's where he's from. My mother is also from Hungary, but from southern Hungary, which after the First World War became part of Yugoslavia. So they're ethnically they were Hungarian. Because of certain situations of my father having served in the Czech army, he could not get working papers in Hungary, which is what he wanted to do as a cantor after he finished his training in Vienna. He found a rather prestigious job in Riga, where we had no family, no connections, or anybody else, but they were there for about three and a half years. And during that time, I was created. And at the time that I was just about to be born, they were waiting for me to be born so my father could go back to Hungary, because he did get working papers. So as Edna had said, in 1936, I was born in May, and I think in July or August, I don't remember, obviously, we moved to Hungary, and we lived there until the war came. He had a job in Hungary, in Budapest, which was a prestigious job as a cantor, one of the four chief cantors of the city of Budapest, which at the time had 200,000 Jews. It's a very large Jewish community. And I just want to interject for those who are not familiar with Jewish religious practice that a cantor um, is a member of the clergy who specializes in both ritual but also music. So uh, your father was a performer as well as a religious leader. The most famous cantor in history is one Johann Sebastian Bach. That was his title, believe it or not. He was a cantor. Uh, you had mentioned a story that your mother had told around uh, someone saying, you now speak Yugoslavian. Can you explain what that means, please, and what borders were well, shifting all the time? Borders were shifting. As I mentioned before, my father was born in Austro-Hungary, served in the Czech army. Today, that village is in the Ukraine. The village did not move. The government did. My mother was from Hungary, which in 1919 or 1918 or so after the First World War, becomes part of the new country of sorts of Yugoslavia. Not the kingdom of Serbia, but Yugoslavia. Today it's Serbia again. My mother tells the story that one day when she's in whatever grade she was in, the age of 10, the teacher comes to the class, or the principal comes in and says, boys and girls, tomorrow, or the week after the weekend, we're going to change language from Hungarian to Serbo-Croatian. If any of you know anything about Hungarian and Serbo-Croatian, you would know that there's not a syllable that's the same in those languages, not even the alphabet. Hungarian is written with the characters that we use in English, and serbo croatian is, is written in Cyrillic alphabet. So they had no issue about it. They were bilingual. But this is the kind of change that came about as the countries changed borders and changed governments. And your grandfather, he was a rabbi, was he? Yes. OK, where did he live? My, my grandfather, my grandmother, my mother's parents lived in the city of Novi Sad and here again. Novi Sad is a Serbo-Croatian name for Uyvidek, which is the Hungarian, and then Neuzatz, which is the German. It's in southern Hungary, northern Yugoslavia. He was the rabbi of the community. My father and my mother met there, and they married there. So I would say for anyone who might be having a little confusion or difficulty following all these languages, they've actually gotten the idea. The idea is this is a very um, cosmopolitan, multicultural, Mixed shifting up environment. Place. Mixed up, that's the technical term, absolutely. Um, so your family, your parents, your father got the job that he wanted in Budapest. This was really a, a plum position, was it not? It was very much so. And you moved to Budapest. Um, how did he come to get that job? What did that mean for your life? Did a lot of people know who you were because you were the Cantor's kid? I can't give you chapter and verse about the early years, the very yeah. early years, because I came there, as I said, I was a few months old. My recollection is much clearer from the time I was about four or five. Life was very nice. My father's income and position was of some significance, so we had a very lovely life, as I remember. Well, you were a child. Right. So um, children, I think, even in stressful situations, they don't know any different. But as you said before, the, the Hungarian anti-Jewish laws, though promulgated in the 20s, did not become enforced until 38. So the beginning of the actual laws, there was really no impact of any of those laws until late 30s. 
as a consequence, life was very good and very comfortable for all of us until it began, they began to squeeze the envelope. So could you tell us a little bit more about that squeezing? What kinds of restrictions, when did that start? And this is under Hungarian rule, not German. As it was mentioned in the introduction, Hungary became a country that was connected to the Nazis as Italy was, namely they were allies. As a consequence, Hungary both had the problem of having a Nazi-connected population. They were called the Arrow Cross, which was the Nazi party of Hungary. But in addition to that, they also had the privilege of not being invaded. If you know your history to some degree, you know that many countries were invaded from 1937, 38, 39, Poland, and so forth. Hungary doesn't have any German troops until 1944. So our life day today was in some ways easier and began to be more difficult as certain restrictions came in. Example, everybody was required to wear a yellow star, which I, as a first grade kid, thought was a mark of distinction. That's terrific. Here I am, a little boy, and I have a yellow star just like the adults do. Until a little bit later when I discovered that this is not a mark of distinction, but a target. Let me explain. We lived on the fifth floor of our apartment building, the top floor. And from the corner of the building where my parents' bedroom was, you could see down the street and you could see my school. We lived at number 13. The school was at number 44. You can imagine, it's like two blocks away. Yet I'm told, and I didn't know this at the time, that most every day, perhaps every day, my father or somebody would follow me to school. Why? Because what was beginning to happen is that this was a target, not a mark of distinction. And somebody would come by and whack you on the head. They don't want your book, book, uh, shoes, your books, your jacket, or anything else. They just want to whack you on the head. Because a Jewish kid to the start can be whacked, and nobody's going to say boo. I didn't know this until a little bit later when I began to discover that maybe a mark of distinction is a misnomer. In 1942, my father began to leave the house because he was called by phone or by letter or by somebody came to the door for what were called the labor battalions. Let me digress just a little bit. Hungarian men were conscripted into the army. As I said, in 1941, they were for fighting on the Russian front. To do the work that the men could not do back in Hungary, the labor forces were created of Jews who were not drafted into the army. So they were called out for one day, for a week, for a month, or for an undetermined period of time to repair roads, to repair railroads, to do some mining, to do other kind of work, work that they had no familiarity with, but you learn quickly. And my father would be gone. From 42 until 44, when we were deported, I saw less of my father than I saw him. He, his being gone was perfectly normal in my life. As a consequence, my father was not in my life for two years. He was home sometimes. One of the times that he's home, I said to him, I wonder if you'd consider doing something for me. He says, what would you like to be, have me do, son? He says, well, I've got this like overgrown tricycle, and I'm now seven years old or so, maybe seven and a half. I could ride an 18-inch bike, not a full-size bike. Would you get me one? He says, getting the bike is not the problem. There are two small prob two problems with the bike. One I can resolve, the other I will not. What's the problem? Fifth floor of the apartment building, the apartment building had an elevator, which was as old as the building, 50 years old, and had brakes and mechanical problems. And the equipment that had to be repaired was repaired in those kinds of workshops and factories, and now we're repairing tanks and guns and stuff, and the elevator parts for my building were kind of low on the priority list. So my father said, I have to truck the bicycle down. We'd have to go to the park. You'd ride the bike. I'd come back and truck the bicycle up. I could not truck a 18-inch bicycle up and down the stairs. It just wasn't big enough or strong enough at the time. My father was. He says, as much as I would not like not to do it, I will do it. The second reason is a more important one. We're in the park, which was near the house, and uh, had the picture come up, you would have seen the park. But the point is, if we go to the park and you ride the bike, you're out of my sight for 12 seconds. Somebody might decide that you and your yellow star, which had to be worn, are a target. And they can whack you on the head. They don't want your bike. They don't want your shoes or your coat. They just want to whack you on the head. Because this is something that says permission is granted. I began to understand at the age of seven that this was not a mark of distinction, but a target. A couple of other things, rather quickly. Man comes to the door and he says, the telephone has to go. My father was home, said to him, well, I need the phone for my work. 
She says, that's too bad. Law was passed, no telephones in Jewish homes. If anybody can see the logic of that, I'd like to know what it was, but that's what it was. Most homes, most middle-class families, and we certainly were middle-class, had some kind of household help. There was a young woman from one of the local farms who lived with us. She was about 17. She had her own quarters in our apartment, and she was my mother's helper. But you want to remember, this is 1939, 1940, and 41. There weren't too many here, but certainly in Europe, there were no washing machines, dryers, refrigerators, freezers, microwaves, and toasters. So all of this work was done by hand. She was told she had to leave the house because Jews could no longer employ any kind of domestic help. She was my buddy because she was the closest in age to me. She was 17, I was about eight, and she had to go. These were the beginning restrictions that came and kind of pulled the straps on a duffel bag and kind of tightened the noose around the Jewish community. I have to grab my timepiece from there. I didn't want to walk while you were talking. Um, did your family have any difficulty in obtaining food during these early years of the war? Were there other kind of material uh, deprivations? My recollection is twofold. One, no. We had all the food we wanted. However, my grandparents who lived in the village, uh, in the how not the village, it's a community of maybe 100,000 where my mother was raised, lived in the courtyard of, a, of the synagogue where my grandfather had been the rabbi. They had apartments on the edge of the courtyard. There was some land. And as the war came, they began to grow some turkeys and some geese in a little cage. And they would send one up to Budapest through a messenger periodically. I don't seem to recall that we needed it, but it's certainly a very nice supplement. The food was OK. I think the context of Hungary um teaches something very interesting to us, that in fact, it's one of the ironies is that since Hungary was allied with Germany, Hungarian Jews in many ways were sort of sheltered from the most chaotic violence of the war until later. It was the lead. Um, let's talk about the first time, though, that you really did encounter violence. In December 41, your family took a trip. Could you tell us about that, please? My parents decided to take, this is the winter of 1941. I was not yet in school, and my father had some time. So they decided to go south by train from Budapest to Novi Sad, my mother's hometown, to visit with my grandparents and my mother's two sisters and one of my cousins, which we did. There was nothing particular about that, about a three, three and a half hour ride by train. And we stayed in my aunt's apartment. My mother was the oldest of three. This is the youngest aunt who became my favorite aunt. It's her birthday today or tomorrow. She's long gone, but we recognize her birthday and as an anecdote. I have one cousin left who lives in Belgrade, in Yugoslavia. She's the daughter of my mother's brother, my first cousin, and I talked with her this morning because we recognize our aunt that way. But we go south to Novi Sad, and we stayed in my aunt's house. I don't recall anything happening the first day or two, although I do remember that her husband took me to uh, his factory. He manufactured cork products. Asked me no more, that's all I can remember. About the third day, in the morning, somebody comes up the elevator or the stairs and says, there's something funky going on in the street. Within a few minutes, knock, knock on the door, and two policemen, I thought rather courteously, say to us, ladies and gentlemen, you need to dress warmly. This is winter. Now, it's not blizzardy or, or terribly frozen, but there's some snow on the ground, and it's winter time. Would you please dress warmly? You need to come out. We have to run a census. Now, we all know that we do census in this country every 10 years. The Nazis felt that if they do a census every 20 minutes, I exaggerate, that would be helpful to them in keeping track of where everybody is all the time. And it, in fact, worked. So tell us to come out. We get dressed. We come out on the sidewalk. They said, please light up on the sidewalk and then turn left and walk in the, that direction, which we did. I remember clearly that we walked for some time, a couple, three hours, perhaps. I walked. My mother carried me. My father carried me. I'm five and a half years old. I'm a little guy. And we arrived in a place that I recognized, believe it or not. There was this eight-foot stockade fence, the sidewalk, and then the main road. In European cities, perhaps some of you know this, that have no oceans or seas or lakes, people will make beaches out of rivers. Now, the Danube River, major river, runs through the city. And on the left side of the stockade fence, between the fence and the river, which was frozen solid about three feet of ice, maybe two or 300 yards, were beaches in the summertime, hot pools, cold pools, thermal pools, amusement park restaurants. It was a lovely place. 
I had been there the previous August. This is only three or four months later. And I remember being there. Why we were there, I didn't know, of course. But neither did the adults. We are lined up along this stockade fence. Eventually, my grandparents also came, and my aunts came, and others. And we kind of huddled together, walking in that direction. And we see that the gate to the beach is open. People will go to the gate and turn left. That's all we know. As we're doing this, there's a police officer standing on the right who says to my father, Mr., what are you doing here? My father says, I'm visiting my family. He says, oh, that's, that's your business. But you're not from here. If we count you in the census, you and the people around you, we'll mess up the numbers. We can't do that. My father said to him, how do you know me? He says, well, you don't recognize me, but I recognize you. I'm a foot patrolman, police officer, street police, a block from your house in Budapest. I was brought in here to assist in this particular project that we're conducting, and I know you're not from here. My father says, well, it's very nice of you to recognize me. I, I did not recognize you. He says, please stand aside, which we did. Within minutes of the standing aside, a staff car comes down the main road, uniformed guy gets out, has a power with the rest of the officers, and makes an announcement to the bullhorn that says, ladies and gentlemen, the requirements of the census have been met. Please go home. If you want to stop at the school over there and get some hot chocolate and coffee, you're welcome to do so. That was not of our interest. But folks, understand, as much as you may be bewildered, so were we. What happened? My father grabs the first taxi. We'll go back to my aunt's apartment. The first call comes in from my other aunt, who says, well, at 7.30 in the morning, two policemen came to her house, asked her three questions, and said, thank you very much, goodbye. As the phone calls begin to come in, we understand what happened. Some of you folks may be familiar with the fact that by this time, this is 1941, late 41, there were certain partisan activities, guerrilla activities, in the forest and whatnot. There's some films made about it. And something happened in the general area of the city. In retribution for this particular activity, the local gendarmes, whatever you want to call them, created a pogrom. P-O-G-R-O-M is a senseless, purposeless, useless, and valueless activity which says, I can do this to you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Everybody made the left turn towards the river and marched two or 300, 400 feet towards the river. The river had been opened up by cannon fire that morning. They were shot into the river. Several thousand people, Jews and non-Jews, were marched into that river, were never found, were found downriver where the ice may have been thinner, or were found as bodies in March when the river thawed out. That was my first experience at any kind of Nazi-related Holocaust experience. Nothing to me personally, because obviously I wasn't shot, but that was my first experience in a visual way of what happened. And these shootings were conducted by policemen, by officers of the and, law. And officers and military and the Hungarian gendarme and, and so forth. But by officials. Absolutely. So the thing that I want to emphasize is that these Hungarian measures and even the early years of Nazi Germany, these were not crimes. These were things that were done within a legal framework, just a discriminatory framework. To the surprise of everybody when I do tours here, and I do, I tell people that there was nothing the Nazis ever did that was illegal. Get a load of that. Nothing illegal. Because what they did is they passed the law, which made anything legal. If you, they wanted to make murder legal, well, murder was legal. So murder was no longer an, an arrestable offense, because they first passed the law, and then everything was legal. This is one of those experiences. In this um, mass murder, this massacre that happened in Novi Sad, approximately how many people were shot? The estimates go up to 3,500, maybe not at that spot, but of this particular several-day pogrom that took place. For those of you who have been through or will go through the museum, you'll see a very famous pogrom of sorts called Kristallnacht, the Night of the Broken Glass, which was also a reaction in Germany that happened before this one I have described to you. So your family returns to Budapest, I'm sure quite shaken from this um, near miss of, of violence. 
Um, by March 1944, tensions, and I'm simplifying very complex history here, um, tensions are increasing, disagreements are increasing between the Hungarian government and their allies in Nazi Germany. And in March 1944, the Germans invade. Uh, they invade Budapest. Um, could you give us a little of that background? Why didn't the Nazis invade Hungary sooner? And what did this actual direct occupation mean for your family and other Jews in Budapest? Well, as allies, they were separate and unequal, but they were separate. In 1942, 41 actually, the number two man in the Nazi government, whom you may recall his name is Hermann Goering, writes a letter on behalf of Hitler which talks about the final solution to the Jewish problem. That is not put into actual operation until 1942. There's a conference in Berlin called the Wannsee Conference. Wannsee is the name of a building. It's still there, and the building has no significance, where the head of the Nazi government in eastern Germany, a general who was later assassinated in Prague, calls a conference and appoints the man who is going to be in charge of managing the transportation of Jews into the various camps. The man's name is Adolf Eichmann if you know the name. Eichmann does a very credible job in what he's able to do in all of the countries throughout Europe. And the last country he comes to because of the Allied connection is Hungary. So the Nazi government does not arrive into Hungary until March the 19th, 1941, which is very late in the war. 44. I'm sorry, 44, of course. Uh, as you recall, D-Day is in June of 44, and the war ends in May of 45. This is very late, and most everybody in the Nazi government understands their future, except for one person who never accepted his future, named Hitler, who thought he would win the war the day before he killed himself. But everybody else kind of knew, and they were taking certain steps to deal with what might happen after the war. Now, wasn't Budapest bombed by the Soviets? And what was that and like, the Allies. Do you remember? The early years of the war, not the Holocaust, are very clear in my mind. We lived in the fifth floor of the apartment building, as I told you, and we would march down to the shelters, which were the basement, twice, sometimes three times a night. And the frightening part of that was the bombing. Because when you came up in the morning, or you came up from the shelter at night, you didn't know that when you went to school the next day, the building next door to you may be bombed out, and three of your friends who, with whom you went to school were dead. So the war was much more of an issue and an impact, and the bombings was much more frightening than Holocaust, which doesn't come until very much towards the end. So once the Germans were there, uh, what happened to your grandparents? I had three grandparents that I knew. My father's mother, who lived in the village. Well, actually, what happened, she lived with us in Budapest. But my father and his youngest brother, who also lived with us, decided that because she had some bad feet, having had seven children who lived and maybe half a dozen others who didn't, she had some feet problems and some diabetic problems. And she should go back to the village where she, was, where she had lived, where she had raised her family, although it was a much more primitive life than no bombings and no war, except what was there was the deportations and she was taken to Auschwitz. My other two grandparents from my mother's hometown were also taken to Auschwitz. Uh, in a transport with my two aunts and my cousin. In Auschwitz and some other camps, which were death camps, a selection would take place. If you go into the museum and you go through the cattle car, when you come out of it, you see two lines of people. The selection consisted of people who could not work, who were then killed within three or four hours. My grandparents and my cousin, a year younger than I, were in that room and that line. My two aunts were in the other line. They were women in their 30s, perfectly healthy. They were put out to work. They both survived the war, war as workers, and they died of various causes many years later after the war. So my grandparents are deported from Novi Sad with my aunts, my cousin, my other grandmothers. The, my fourth grandparent, my father's father, I never knew. He died of totally different causes in 1930, I think, or 31. So before you were born. Before I was born. And just to be clear uh, for people in the audience, there's a distinction between death camps, or sometimes we refer to them as killing centers, which are camps that the Germans created 
explicitly for the um, purpose of mass murder. That is the only purpose of them. And other camps, concentration camps, where often prisoners were exploited for slave labor, as Banny described his two aunts, um, and as indeed your father was exploited uh, as slave labor. He was in the camp. He was in these labor battalions, which were a different version of the same thing, but yeah. not in the camp. But that these many uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of people, their unpaid uh, and um, extensive labor was essential to the German war effort. So They had to replace the manpower that was fighting on the front lines. Exactly, exactly. Um, so let's go into later spring 1944. Because of the circumstances we've described, at this point, the Jews of Budapest are really the last intact Jewish community in all of German-occupied <clears throat> Europe. What changes in May 1944? Well, even earlier than May, Eichmann arrives in Budapest on the 19th of March. And within, I don't know, hours or days, two men from kind of a self-appointed rescue committee are able to see him. Now, do understand, please, that Eichmann's situation was such that to see him was about as easy as walking into Rome <coughs> excuse me, and saying, I want to see the Pope. Not easy. But they manage it. And they begin to talk with him about any kind of a deal that could be made. Now, why a deal? As I said a minute ago, everybody knew at the time in the German government that the war will not end well for them. They were beginning to think about what's going to happen to them after the war. And this goes all the way from Eichmann, who was a lieutenant colonel in the German army, to Heinrich Himmler, who was number three in the German government, the head of the Nazis. They began to make deals. They made a number of them. I don't know how many. But the only one I know about is the one that had to do with me. They come up with a proposition that says, if Eichmann releases one million Jews from the various camps, one million, they will supply him with 10,000 trucks laden with certain material to be used in a war effort. Now, there was a major problem with this proposition. If Eichmann wanted to release a million people, he couldn't. He didn't have them anymore. This is too, too, too late in the war. As far as 10,000 trucks, these guys didn't have a hubcap. I mean, nothing. It's a bluff to the end of the world. One of the too many sent actually under... With a, with, a, with a Nazi official to, in, to Cairo, to Egypt, to negotiate with the British about trucks because the British command in Cairo was responsible for all the transport that was in Europe during the war, all the trucks and everything else. He got no trucks. He was put in jail as a spy, survived the war in Cairo jail, and lived after the war for any number of years, unrelated to the whole deal. The deal of 10,000 trucks for a million people Obviously, it was a, an enormous non-existent situation, and it was reduced to the point that the agreement was made that Eichmann will give, will select 35 cars, boxcars, for about 1,700 people to be taken out of Budapest to a neutral port to be dispatched from Europe. Hitler said, I want Jews out of Germany, which he got. Jews out of Europe, which he almost got, and Jews out of the world, which he did not get. We were supposed to board these trains for a ride to whatever port in Spain, neutral country, maybe Turkey, maybe even Germany. But instead of our going directly to these ports, we went north into northern Germany, near the city of, of Hanover, to a camp called Bergen-Belsen. You might not know Bergen-Belsen. It was not a death camp. Lots of people died, but there were no, no crematoria. The most famous person who died in Bergen-Belsen was Anne Frank. We were taken to Bergen-Belsen. We were told we we're going to be here for three days as rest and recuperation after a nine-day train ride for the purpose of getting ready for a boat ride. Not quite so. I want to back up on it for a couple of sentences, that the negotiator in Budapest with Eichmann is a Jewish lawyer by the name of, of Kastner, Rudolf Kastner, who was part of this rescue committee, and he was the negotiator. His life is interesting. He later on met with a very fateful death in then Israel for many reasons. I'm not going to detail that, but you need to know the name Rudolf Kastner, who perhaps was the 
most active Jew in the rescue of Jews. I'm not talking about Schindler, I'm not talking about Wallenberg, who were non-Jews, but of Jews, he may have been the most specific person in that particular issue. Now, we go to Bergen-Belsen, and we thought we were going to be three days. After six weeks, negotiations continue. After six weeks, 350 of us were released under on, on German command and taken to Switzerland. I wasn't one of them. Four months after that, for a total of about five and a half months, in December, I and my mother who was with me, my father was not, are also taken to Switzerland. Now understand, please, we were a hostage group. It was not in the interest of the German government to kill us. Because if you kill us, you can't trade us. You can't trade dead bodies. The issue was, the deal was no million for 10,000 trucks, but about 1,700 for what they called valuables. As you can imagine, valuables were the things that you could carry in a suitcase. Diamonds, rubies, jewelry, not cash. Money was useless. Unless you had dollars, which nobody had, or you had British pounds sterling, which nobody had. But other kinds of valuables which are negotiated worldwide have ever been, in fact, were the valuables for which we were exchanged. They would not get these valuables unless they delivered us live. Our life was the same as everybody else in these camps, in terms of weather, in terms of food, in terms of mud, in terms of illness. But at least we were not turned out to labor, and as a consequence, most of, all of us, in fact, survived. So I want to pause for a second just to be sure that everyone's following because I think um, it is more common to think about the Holocaust as some kind of natural disaster, that once it's started, there is no way to alter the course, there is no discretion. But in fact, what you're describing to us is that local authorities often had a lot of discretion, the power to decide life or death, and had their own personal interests in um, negotiating or bargaining in this case um, for different means and different ends. Let me point out that Eichmann and others, you may know another name by the name of Dr. Joseph Mengele, the famous physician who was the experimenter in Auschwitz, these guys wound up in South America. Mengele was never found, Eichmann was, but the point is these people created lives for themselves in South America for the loot that they carried, not just from us, from the various groups that were exchanged, as it were. I can assure you that Eichmann was not a shoe salesman in South America. He had a very comfortable life because he had this, these kinds of things that he took in suitcases from the several groups that were able to make these negotiated settlements. Himmler himself was going to be part of it. Himmler was captured after the war, escaped, was recaptured, at which point he committed suicide. So <coughs> in context, Manny and his mother and the others in this uh, very lucky group of 1,700 people um, were really saved from almost certain death. Over the course of approximately two months, over 425,000 Hungarian Jews were deported to the Auschwitz-Birkenau killing center, where almost all of them were gassed upon arrival. When Eichmann arrives in Hungary, just as a word, one sentence, he begins the deportations at the rate of 12,000 a day. 12,000 people a day were, were, in, were taken out. The only thing that limited it to 12,000 was the number of boxcars they had. They had a limited number. Some of you come from communities which are less than 12,000 in size. So these 1,700 uh, hostages, bargaining chips, um, you described it as those who had certain eligibility. How were you fortunate enough to be in this group? The simple and correct answer is I don't know. Okay. Not just because I'm a child, but this was such a complex system in which some people were involved in apportioning seats on these trains, not seats, but space, to religious groups, political groups, other kinds of groups, to various people of importance, various people of certain status, and I don't know how we were included. Yes, my father had an important position in town. Yes, my uncle had an important position in some political involvement, so that may have had something to do with us, but specifically, I cannot tell you. You were eight years old when you arrived at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Uh, what do you remember about daily life and the time you were there, and also an incident with your uncle and his uh, shoes I've heard about? So. We lived in these barracks. The camp was divided into certain sections, a certain number of barracks in each section. There were men, there were women, and there were families. Families meant children and their mothers. 
not fathers. I really don't remember. I have to think about whether any fathers and mothers were in the family camp, but certainly mothers were. And that's where I was, uh, my mother and I and the rest of the people. The camp was not very warm. We had clothes. I mean, we were not, we were even had some food that we brought. We're told to bring certain food for the ride to the boats. And you'd be amazed to know that certain food lasts months when you slice it with a razor blade. Let me tell you, my mother packed a number of things. She packed a quart or a liter of oil, not oil, chicken fat, a liter of honey, and a great big slab of some kind of bacon type fat back. Now understand that that's very unusual for us. We lived in a kosher home. My father was a religious leader. To have bacon was against the rules, but under certain circumstances, rules are not so much broken, but altered. The, the two bottles of liquid, of fat, which is nutritious, and the honey, which is also nutritious, and the bacon, lasted six months. They were, I don't know how she did it, but that's what she did. We also had some other stuff with us that we brought that lasted for a while. We discovered in Budapest still that there was a man that we knew, or people knew, who had a factory that could reseal tin cans. So when you had a tin can of food, and you used what was in the tin can, you could have it sanitized, put new food in it, and then he would put a new lid on it of some sort, and press it in some way so that botulism doesn't happen. We had some of those with us. So food in the beginning was not a catastrophe. But the weather was. This was beginning to be fall time, and it was rain every day, and the most difficult thing every day was the fact that we had to have a census every day. Do you remember the census? We were told to be out at daybreak, <coughs> 4 o'clock in the morning. They would come and check us at 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 11, and we'd be outside for all these hours until one of the lieutenants said, this is ridiculous. I will be here at 8 o'clock. You'll be here at 8. I don't care when you get here. An enormous change for our lives when we could be out there at 7.45. We were there at 8. But it's a lot different being out for 15 minutes than for being out for several hours. Now, as we were outside the Namakana Mire of the winter of 1944, my parents had a pair of shoes made for me, my mother did, before we left. She figured we were going to be in some kind of travel. In those days, you didn't buy shoes in stores. You had them made by a shoemaker. The method of shoemaking had to do with taking the shoes, whatever, I'm not a shoemaker, and you sew the bottom, and then you put <coughs> dowels in the bottom. It's like little matchsticks, little dowels that you hammer in, because if it gets wet, these dowels expand and keep the sole together with the shoe. But after you are, in fact, outside in the wet for hours and hours and hours and days and days, these dowels fall out. So my shoes went like this. My uncle was able to make an arrangement whereby he was able to find somebody who had cobbler's tools with him, shoemaker tools. And my, my uncle had two cigarettes, which he gave to the cobbler. The cobbler fixed the shoes. And he came to me and he said, son, your shoes are repaired. Now, don't walk any faster than half a mile an hour because they'll fall out again. Now, here's a kid who has nothing to do all day long with anybody else, and I couldn't even run around with my buddies, but at least not when he was watching. But still, from um, malnutrition, exposure to the elements, you eventually got very sick, didn't you? I had some kind of multiple pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is a disease that is curable by antibiotics, which were just being invented in those days or discovered. And of course, we were not the first ones to get them. We had 35 doctors in the group, but they had nothing to, with which to treat anything. The only treatment they could give me, and I did recover, obviously, is something <laughs> that some of you who may have some farm backgrounds might remember or your grandparents told you. <clears throat> they wrapped me in mustard plaster. You take burlap, don't know where they got the burlap. You take mustard powder, and you soak it in water, and you soak the burlap in it, and you put it on you. The impact of that is like Bengay, or like Vicks. It gives a mentally kind of heat. It makes you feel more comfortable. You know that pneumonia is a disease that makes your lungs hurt. And if you breathe, you rub it against your ribs, and it hurts. This gives you some palliative kind of help, makes you feel better. It doesn't cure the pneumonia. I guess my body did. But the 
muster plaster at least helped me survive the disease for the weeks that I had it. You mentioned your father was not with you. Where was he? Did you have any contact with him? No. As I said, from 42 to 44, my contact with my father was very limited. He was in labor camp. From 44 to 46, I didn't see him at all. He was in territorial Hungary on all these labor battalions until the time, approximately the time that we left Hungary, at which point he and his groups, or whatever what they call them, were taken out of Hungary and sent to the Ukraine, which is not that far, but it's a neighboring country, and that's where they did their work. In late 40, in, while we were in concentration camp, well, we didn't know this until afterwards, my father and about 20 of his buddies decided to just walk away from the camp. The Russians were approaching, the Germans were retreating, and they were able to get away. They walked at night, they slept during the day, they stole food as well as they could, and they walked back from Ukraine to Budapest, arriving there in late 44, before the Russians liberated the city. And you and your mother, in the meantime, in December 44, as you mentioned, you were finally sent to Switzerland, which was neutral. Tell us about what that was like, your arrival there, how the Swiss authorities treated you. The Swiss are marvelous people. Cold as ice, but marvelous. Very efficient. I will never forget arriving by German troop. This is not a boxcar. It's a troop train. It's not first class, but it's a troop train with seats. We arrived on one side of the platform from Germany, and on the other side of the platform were the Swiss trains. Please understand that the Germans and the Swiss had this arrangement. The Swiss made it. The German train gauge is different than the Swiss gauge. You can't drive a German train into Switzerland. It's a good way not to have them invaded. So we had to cross the platform from these dinky, dark, semi-pleasant trains into these beautiful, warm, heated, full of hot chocolate Swiss trains on the other side of the platform to be taken to a community, to a, actually to a gymnasium or a school, a couple of schools because there were 1,300 of us. And what the first thing that the Swiss did was fumigate all of us. They did not want to have any kind of lice, vermin, and other kind of stuff to be invading their country. We're taken to a beautiful hotel in the French part of Switzerland that was held by the Red Cross for several weeks to get fattened up. We were not emaciated, but all of us could use a couple of pounds. Later on, we were all discharged from there so others could come in, and my mother and I were sent to a children's home in the German part of Switzerland, where we stayed until we left Switzerland. And why was your mother with you in a home that was for children? 20 children from this very lovely hotel were sent to this children's home. That had to be sent someplace. Now, we spoke one language. It was Hungarian, which nobody spoke. There had to be somebody there who could be our interpreter, our teacher, our guardian, and our caretaker. My mother had been an elementary school teacher when she was younger. So they decided it's a perfect choice. My mother obviously spoke Hungarian. She also had very good German from school and a good amount of French. The people in this school were kids from Belgium and from France, and their leadership was from Germany, mostly German Jews who ran this children's home, or you want to call it a boarding school of sorts, so my mother could become the liaison between us and them and ran a school for 20 kids ages 6 to 14. She was a school mom for this kind of a school, and that's why she came along. Now, being there as the teacher's kid is the best of all worlds and the worst of all worlds. <laughs> if anything ever happened, if anybody ever did anything wrong, guess who was blamed for ratting on them? <coughs> but it's survivable. But it was extraordinarily unusual for a Jewish boy born in the time and place where you were not only to survive, but to be with your mother for the duration of the war. Yes. Um, Extraordinarily lucky. Do you have any sense? Have you done any work to try to trace what happened to your classmates in Budapest? Do you have some sense if any of them survived? Yes. Some, and I could detail all of them that I know. One, for example, was with me both in camp and then in the Swiss home in Haydn, who became a world renowned rice professor at Michigan State University. We fell into each other's laps in some correspondence. Unfortunately, he died of cancer some years ago, but we did meet two or three times here. Um, he was one. Another one who never left Switzerland, I had contact with, and by the time I got back to Switzerland, he was gone. 
Another one was who's three years older than I, who became a Hungarian-born, Swiss-educated German professor in England. <laughs> he now lives in Switzerland. He moved to Switzerland to get out of the current British government situation. And he wrote a book called Dealing with Satan, which is a story of Kastner, whom I mentioned before, and his negotiations with Eichmann. It's a very fine book that describes our life and he writes on a first-person basis, although he was three years older than I, he was old enough to be a man. I was a kid. In the very few minutes that we have left, and I would like to allow a few minutes for audience questions, could you tell us um, what happened to your family, what choices your parents were able to make after the war ended in May 1945 in Europe? Where did you go? In May 1945, I'm in Switzerland, in this home. The original notion that was made about our deportation from Hungary and to be placed on ships, we were to be taken to Palestine in those days. My mother made the decision in Switzerland that she will never go back to Hungary again under any circumstance, and she never did. Because she, it was too painful, or what was her reasoning? It was too painful, and she decided she hated the Hungarians. She went back to Yugoslavia, which was really Hungary of sorts, but not to Hungary. That's what we did. We wound up in Palestine in September 1945. By this time, she and my father had reconnected. We had, my father had a colleague in Switzerland who, because she was Swiss, was able to communicate with Hungary. My mother was not. So my mother would talk to this Cantor colleague. He would have contact with my father. My father would respond to his colleague, and he back to us. This went on a number of different ways. My mother said, my, my, my father says, come back to Budapest. The apartment is here. I have a job. My mother said, absolutely not. Follow us, which he did. Eventually, we get to Palestine in 45. My father arrives in 46. And as I said, from 42 to 44, I, never, I saw him a little bit. From 44 to 46, I didn't see him at all. We reunited and kind of created a new family. Understand, we have changed languages, countries. What I called my father was a different word than what I called him before. What he called me was a different word. So we had to kind of restart the family. I, at the age of nine, and my parents had to reconnect as husband and wife. And from that point on, we're together. My parents decided, after being in Palestine and then Israel, my father had an opportunity to come to Philadelphia to visit his one remaining sister and was able to make some arrangements by which he could stay in this country. And he decided that might be better than being in Israel at the time. My family took a vote, and I lost. They wanted to come to the States. I wanted to stay there. But it was a two-to-one vote. I came to the States in 1949. And what was that adjustment like? New language, new school, <laughs> new country. Otherwise, it was simple. Um, I think we should open it up to questions from the audience. I have many more things I could ask you, but I've been able to, to hog the stage. Um, we have, do we have, yeah, we have microphones so that everyone can hear. So that gentleman in the back. Uh, yes, please. Uh, Manny, you said you went from Budapest to Belsen and it took nine days. What was that journey like? Well, the journey was not direct. Cattle cars had to avoid bombings, had to avoid air raids, had to avoid certain kinds of halls to make changes in the guards, so we kind of meandered. I don't know how long the ride would be, probably a day's ride. I don't know the mileage exactly, but it would probably be a day's ride from Budapest to northern Hungary, uh, to northern Germany. But uh, it took nine, because we didn't go quite straight. We had, we were boxcars were locked in during the day. It was still July. The weather was good. We could sleep outside on the guard. And as I said, we were told to bring some food. And there were field kitchens that were brought in to give us certain food. Food is not a problem, but you want to remember, you can go without air for minutes, water days, and food, water hours, and, and food days. That was not a problem. I mean, a large one. Survivable. Uncomfortable, but survivable. Other questions? It's a shy group. <laughs> oh, yes, there's one there. We've got one right here. Oh, first this young man, and then someone in the center. Thank you. How many languages do you know? Well, I try English. <laughs> I still speak Hungarian. I know a bit of German, enough to kind of get by, not to get lost. And I still speak Hebrew from my time in Palestine and Israel. That's what I do. So that's four. That's three and a half. 
Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, in the way back. Thank you. Um, I, maybe this is a stupid question. I, I've always wondered it, though. Why, what if you just didn't wear the yellow star, identifying you as, as a Jew? To go for the yellow star. That? I'm sorry? Who forced you to, to, what if people just said, I'm not going to do this? Identifying you, we, how did they know that you were Jewish compared to, say, a neighbor who wasn't? I, I've always wondered about that. Because you had to have some kind of papers with you, and you could be examined on the street 42 times a block. And if they found that you were a Jew without a star, they'd shoot you. Period. Okay, so that, all right, thank you. I just. <laughs> <laughs> so they could, they could examine anyone. They could walk up to anybody and just say, show They me. did. Oh, okay. The, you may want to remember, folks, and we never had that in this country, at least not to my knowledge, that there you couldn't cross borders without papers. You couldn't cross streets. You had to have identity cards at all times. Uh, in this country, how often are you examined for your, your identity? I mean, you are if you go on the airports, and sometimes if people with, woo, stop you in a car. But short of that, how often do you have to pull out an ID card? You go to the hospital, you have to have an ID card. In Europe, that was not the case, particularly during the war. Identity cards were, I mean, you kind of could have walked like this with them because you could have been asked any time, and you were. Why are you on this street, in this section, something like that. And if you had an identity card which said you had a Jew, which is a big J on it, because Jew is spelled with a J in a number of languages. If you were there without a star, I need not say any more. And I can tell you, in the museum's collections, we have identity cards from countries across Europe. I'm picturing one from Norway, which also has a big red J. But it also reminds you, again, of opportunities. If someone could obtain false papers, either forged papers or assume the identity of someone else, that was a way to hide in plain sight as a Jew. Um, and some people did survive that way. Um, we have only one or two minutes left. It is our tradition at first person that our first, oh, we do have one more question. One question. Wait, yeah. we need the mic for you because we're recording and also we want everyone to hear, so. so oh, I'm sorry, you... did you have someone there? Yeah. Go ahead, we'll, we'll, we'll stay two Bruce, minutes Bruce, I'll get to you in a second. I'm, a, I'm just forcing you all the to Gentlemen, I happen so. to know. Uh, last year we were in Budapest and uh, we were told that after the war was over, Soviet Union came in to uh, uh, occupy, and that the atrocities continued greatly, and even more severely than the Nazis. Is this true? Well, I can't speak to it firsthand. I wasn't there. Uh, the Soviet Union, remember, liberated Hungary. Liberated Hungary as they liberated any number of countries where they imposed the rule. The anti-Semitic behavior at the time was kind of difficult in terms of restrictions. The atrocities were not daily shootings or march to the river and being shot, and there were not concentration camps, but there were significant, significant kinds of, how do I put it, restrictions. So it was not the same as the Nazis, but it was better, but not by much. No deportations, food was rationed. There were lots of difficulties under the Russian rule in all of the Russian-occupied countries, including Hungary. Yes. Manny, how did you come up with the preserved photographs of you as a little boy after all these years and after all these travails that you, you survived? When a bombing started in Europe, many people, most people, all of us had certain kinds of storage lockers, both in the attic of our building and in the basement. That had earthen floors. What people did, my parents did this, they dug out parts of this earthen floor, not to bury anything to hide it, but to save it from the bombings. If a bomb fell on a building or in our apartment, you would destroy everything. And they put stuff in several crates they were able to do, and this protected them. My mother had certain dishes and certain other kind of finery and books and pictures and whatnot that they were able to put there. After the war, my father came back, was able to find this, and then ship it out. But it was a protection from the bombings, not protection from anything else. And they were not hidden in the sense of you know, hiding your valuables, just kind of burying them to protect them from the, from the ter ter terrible devastation that bombs can cause. OK? That's why I have them. Uh, I do want to mention, Manny told me just before the program that actually there is a new book about his family's life. It's called Imi, 
uh, sorry, IMI, which is uh, the nickname for Emmanuel, Manny's full name. Um, we have it in the museum shop and can fill in more of these details. Um, but it is our tradition at first person that the first person guest has the last word. So anything you'd like to share? In the closing? museum has no more books because we had a book signing here on Sunday and Monday. And they're out of books. I've asked them to reorder. I guess it takes a little while to do it. It is available on Amazon, and it's also on Kindle, for your information. I've been asked to do this. I've done the first person, I think, 10 times, if I'm not mistaken. And I've usually given the opportunity to make some kind of pithy comment at the end. I thought about it, and I thought what I would do, folks, is I would give you a challenge. As I said, I'm a docent to the museum, and I do certain other volunteer things. And I find that most folks, forgive me for being blunt, know very little history, including the history of their own family. So I would like to challenge all of you to the following. I'd like you to go home and either find or buy any kind of a small recorder or use your phone and mark down the history of your own family. For those of you who do not know your grandparents' history or even your parents' history, when I ask kids, where do your parents work? And they tell me, for the US government. That's not enough. This information ought to be retained, and it can be retained today. I would love to be able to go to the Library of Congress, pull a disc, and have somebody from the Civil War or from Genghis Khan's troops talk to me and tell me what happened. But it was impossible. Today it's possible, and we should preserve this kind of history. You remember the man's name. No, you don't remember the name. But the man who said, those of us who do not learn our history well may be doomed to repeat it. His name was George Santayana over 100 years ago. Remember his words, and in order to not make happen what he talked about, possibly, record your information of your family. It might be valuable in the future. That's my challenge, and I thank you. Manny, thank you very much. It was an honor to be with you today.